scan the QR code on the seat back in front of you or see the bulletin. And thanks for being at Faith Today. Amen, amen. Thanks for being at Faith Today. It's such a good day, amen. You know, as we, as we run through life, as we run, maybe I don't know what your daily schedule is or our schedule general season of life is, but as we're running through life and just running and running and running, I just love to run and run and get here and then just all sing together, just like that unity that comes as we sing and just be with the people of God and just turn our attention to God. You know, as we see and are reminded in worship of how big he is, we remember that he is in control and it's a good thing. Amen. We have uh, uh, received our baptistry, finally. Uh, we've only been in the building for about a year now, but uh, we, we finally got it. And uh, we are excited that on Memorial Day weekend, this is how the schedule worked out, but uh, we will have our first baptism here in the sanctuary on that Sunday and Saturday, uh, Saturday night service and Sunday. Yes, amen, amen. So I wanna encourage you. If you've never been baptized and you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it is a direct command from him to be baptized. You know, so many of the things that we talk about, there's, well, I'm not sure I see it that way, or I don't know, maybe I do it this way or that way. And, and I get it, and that's good. There's room for all of us, right? And we'll get to heaven and figure out that I'm, no, I'm just kidding. Um, it was a joke. It really was, okay? Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, but, you know, there's the, the God, Jesus gave us the direct command to be baptized. And if you've not been baptized, you need to be baptized if you're a follower of Jesus. You know, I hear people say all the time, well, that person's too young. And then I hear people say, well, I'm too old. And, and it's just like, well, what is the perfect age? You know, where are you? What excuse do you have uh, next? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean that, you know. Um, but uh, if you've not been baptized, you need to be baptized. So please get on the app. If you don't have the app, that QR code in front of you will lead you right there, sign up and join us for baptism on the last Sunday uh, of this month. Okay, sound good? Not this month, next month. It's, it's still April, it's still April. I don't know, where am I? What, you know, who am I? What am I doing? So we're in part four of our series on the gardener. We do have one more part. We'll finish up uh, next Sunday and uh, on this, but here we are remembering, you know, we're four weeks out from the resurrection and acknowledging that Jesus' resurrection changes everything in our lives. It changes our perspective on everything. It changes our lives. It points us back to life in the garden. Uh, when Adam and Eve were put in the Garden of Eden to be gardeners, it points us back and says, hey, we're gardeners too, pointing to a life that is meaningful, pointing to the first commission of God, which was to subdue and tend the earth. Whatever ways that we make the world beautiful, whatever ways we make the more, world more serviceable, however we help other people, whatever we create, when we clean things like a toilet, can I get an amen? When we, whatever we're doing, right? We are, are fulfilling that first commission. And I know you're, you're sitting here and you're like, okay, pastor, we're four weeks in. Like, I get it. Okay. In just a second, you're going to talk about 3% and then a hundred percent. And I get it. And I get it. But here's the deal. Like, this is something I think that's been programmed into us maybe for decades. Maybe you've been coming to church for a long time. And the subtle message, if not the overt message, is that the only thing that matters to God is when I'm praying or when I'm at church or when I'm reading my Bible or when I'm witnessing about Jesus right? And yet we read the scriptures and so plainly that is not true, right? That is not true. In fact, God cares about a hundred percent of my life because he created us to live on this earth and to fulfill the commission of tending and subduing this creation. And so you say, pastor, you keep saying that over and over. It's like, I've been here every week and I keep hearing it over and over. Well, I'm trying to work against decades of you believing that the only thing God cares about is when you're praying, and then you get up and he's like, well, you could be praying. It's like, listen, we're gonna go to heaven one day, right? And in heaven, guess what? We're gonna get to talk to God and we're gonna get to praise God and we're gonna do all those things. If, he, if that's all he cares about, why not just take us to heaven? But he leaves us here for a purpose. He leaves us here to subdue and tend and make life better for other people and clean and order and make beautiful things and all of those things. And God cares about that. And that is the call on our lives. And we rejoice in that. You know, we talked about the fact that the new heavens and the new earth come and God's gonna carry the best of what we do and the best of our culture into the new heavens and the new earth. If you missed the heaven sermon, I don't remember if it was part two or part three, but you, I think part two, but you need to go back and check it out because I think that's incredible that the things that we do are gonna be carried over into eternity. You know, uh, this reality should affect how we worship, that God cares about 100% of our lives and, and, and that we should worship like people that were in the garden. We should worship like people who didn't have problems and didn't have sin. Our sin and our brokenness, God cares about those things, but those shouldn't be the things that we're most passionate about. 
Because people in the garden didn't have sin and didn't have brokenness. And they came to God and they worshiped God and they blessed God and they were designed for that. So just like Abraham brought Isaac to the Lord and it was worship, we should bring the best things to God in our lives. What are you good at? Whatever you're good at. Uh, you say, uh, you know, I'm not good at praying. I'm not good. I'm not good. You know, I read the scriptures and I don't understand it the same way other people do. That's okay. All right? Just get with somebody else that's good. They'll pray you through. We'll, we'll, we'll work out our salvation together around the scriptures. What are you good at? Whatever you're good at, God cares about it because you're fulfilling that first commission. So whatever you're doing, it matters to God. Amen? I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just, again, I, I can kind of almost visualize decades of you feeling like the only thing that mattered to God was, you know, this 3% and I'm fighting against it up here. All right? But, you know, this morning we, we recognize that, that there is something, a deeper surrender, even than surrendering our hopes and dreams and plans like Abraham surrendered. You know, Abraham surrendered Isaac, and I mean, man, that was an amazing surrendering act of surrendering his hope for the future. But there's even a deeper level of surrender than that. And so you can imagine that this message might be a little hard this morning. And, and, and I, don't, I don't enjoy the hard messages. I just want to tell you, it seems like part four of every series, it's like the 401 class in college, right? It's like, this is when it gets hard. This is when it gets lousy. I don't enjoy it. I don't look forward to it. I've been praying all week that Jesus would come back. <laughs> After church last night, I prayed Jesus would come back even while I slept last night so that... Uh, we here, but you know, I have a picture in my mind and that picture is you standing before the Lord and giving an account of your life. And I don't want you to be standing there and, and God saying, well, what about this? And you say, well, nobody ever told me that. And I mean, we don't have an excuse because it's all pretty plain right here, but at the same time, I feel a responsibility so that, you know, you can't say, well, man, I went to church for years and years and years and Pastor Jason never told me that. And uh, so this morning's one of those mornings and I'm so glad you're here. We are going to read four passages of scripture this morning. That's when I get nervous, we read more Bible. And uh, so uh, here we go. And we're gonna start with the words of Jesus. When I get nervous, we start with the words of Jesus. And uh, we're gonna begin in John chapter two. And uh, then we're gonna move through uh, to Philippians and, and uh, 1 Corinthians, a couple passages there. So we're in John chapter two, starting at, at verse 18. And it says this, the Jews then responded to Jesus, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're gonna raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. Then in Philippians chapter three, starting at verse 17, join together in following my example, this is Paul speaking, brothers and sisters, and just as you have, uh, have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, Paul says this, do, not, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. In 1 Corinthians 7 and 4, for the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Let's pray together. Oh God, we worship you and we bless you. And Lord, we are so comforted as we just get a glimpse of how big you are and how in control you are. Lord, we desire to follow after your ways because your ways are the best ways. And we pray, God, that you would lead us, that you would guide us and direct us, Father. We rejoice that you care about our lives, God, all of our lives, and that you walk with us and you created us and rejoice with us, God, as we live. Lord, and I just pray that you would lead us, God, because we wanna live like you want us to live. Lord, because we've come to see that that is the best way and that leads to our best and greatest happiness and best and happiest life, God. Lord, as we turn to your word today, Lord, draw our hearts closer to you. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. And everyone said, 
Amen and amen. When the kids were really little, we, we had three kids and they were under four and I was working two jobs and Michelle was working uh, outside the home as well as trying to keep three kids under four. And if you've been in that season, you know it's an exhausting, exhausting season, right? Just so glad to be out of that season. If you're in it, there's hope, right? Like God will, God will see you through that season. But as we're in this season, right, you know, all these jobs and all these kids, our car breaks down. And, uh, and you know, the car breaks down and what are you gonna do? And we gotta get all these different places and you know, Michelle was working Starbucks 5 a.m. And I don't, what do you do? You wake up three kids at five, I don't know. And so one of our friends was, was really gracious and he, he loaned us his, his extra car. And if you ever have a friend that has an extra car, you know, that's a, that's a good friend, um, you know? Uh, but his extra car was kind of a sporty car and it was a coupe and it had a little tiny back seat, right? And there were five of us <laughs> and three of us required booster seats. Uh, so that back seat was pretty tight in there, you know? But this car, it was a sporty car and it would go really fast. And Noah was old enough where he understood Zoom Zoom, right? And so I was like, all right, we're gonna load up in this car. And you know, we put Ben and Kate on the sides. I put Noah in the middle so that he could see out the front window, right? And I got him in there and we got in there and I, I hit it, right? I put it to the ground and I was like, here we go, Zoom Zoom. And the car made a noise. And it was like a psh kind of noise. And then the engine started to sputter, poop, 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 right? And I just pulled into the, pulled into the nearest parking lot and the tar, car had to be towed and, and the bill to fix the car was $5,000. And, and I was, uh, you know, again, you're in that season of life and everything. And, my, and the mechanic and my friend, they assure me and they say, listen, this is, it wasn't your fault. This was the car's fault. It was, it was what it was. There, there's a recall on this part and everything. But I mean, it's basically the whole engine like had to be replaced in this vehicle. So Michelle and I, we don't borrow things anymore. Like, like that is just, that's like a rule. Somebody say, hey, do you want to use this? And, and we'll like in unison be like, no, no, we don't want to use it. Because there was in that like sentence, I remember that sentence of like the repair is going to be $5,000. And I'm just like, you know, <gasps> but, and I was like, that's the greatest but in my whole life. You know, it's like, but it's, you know, it's a, 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 a um, warranty uh, part here, a, a recall part. And I was just like, wow, that's incredible. You know, I, I try to take care of things when I borrow them, but the other side of that is, I don't know if you've seen people uh, that when they borrow things, they don't take care of it. I don't know if you've been at work and you've got, you know, at at work and and people are like, well, it's a company car. Well, this belongs to the company and they just use it and abuse it, right? And they don't care. Maybe it's a a younger person. They have something that belongs to their parents and they're like, oh, it's not parents. I don't care. You know, we'll use it and abuse it, right? And how many times I made a note to self, like note to self, do not let them use anything that belongs to me, right? Because they don't take care of things that belong to other people. Now, if you own it, if it's yours. You could do whatever you want with it. You could treat it however you want. You can use it, abuse it, break it. I don't care. I might think you're dumb, but it's your business, right? It's your stuff. And when it comes to cars and houses and sports equipment and tools, ownership matters because if it's yours, you can use it however you want to. And that's a pretty straightforward principle. Like we all get that, right? Like if I own it, I can use it however I want to. It's a straightforward principle until we get into this idea of the reality that God owns our bodies, that God created our bodies, that God gave us freedom to use our bodies, and then we chose to break our bodies through sin, and then God purchased back our bodies on the cross. This is plain from the scriptures we read, and and I I stopped at four, I could have read many more, but God owns our bodies. You know, and and so what does it mean in practical terms that when I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, that I am acknowledging God's ownership of my body? I mean, there's nothing more mine than my body, right? And yet God says he owns it. And when I accept Jesus and say, Jesus, I believe in you. You are the Lord and Savior of my life. What I do is I surrender and recognize the reality that he owns my body. And so how do I approach that? What does that mean for me? How do I live in that reality? And if the first thing that we recognize is that this should affect how we think about and how we talk about our bodies. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, we said this earlier, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So you were bought at a price, your body belongs to God and how you think about it and how you talk about it should be impacted by that reality. 
You know, I've never met anybody that loved everything about their body, right? I mean, even somebody and you look at them and you think, wow, you know, they're, they're, they're beautiful, they're handsome, they're, you know, whatever. And you talk to them and they're like, I hate this about my body. I've never met anybody who would say, I just love everything about my body, right? And as we get older, you know, we start, that list gets a little longer of things that maybe we don't like about our body. But how is it that I talk about it? How is it that I think about it? And what dynamic does that create? If I walk up to you and start talking to you about how ugly your wife is, how ugly your boyfriend is, how ugly your kid is. And just every time you see me, I'm just like, dude, how did you marry her? She is a dog, (laughs) right? I mean, what's your opinion of me gonna be? I mean, what what is the dynamic gonna be? I'm just like, that is the ugliest kid I've ever seen. You know, I mean, what, what are you going to think? Right. But what, but what do we do? What do we do? We come to God and we're like, God, Hey, this is, this is your body. I acknowledge that, but God, I hate this about my body. And I hate that about my body. And, and, and we harp on it and we tell anyone who will listen sometimes how much we hate this or that about ourselves. And we don't realize that this is a spiritual conversation that we're having. Because God owns your body and ownership matters. And when I begin to talk about it, when I begin to think about it, I have to realize that there is another invested party in this conversation, that it is God, the owner of my body. And this is a spiritual conversation and a spiritual dynamic that that is going on and that we're having in our lives. Because what happens when I begin to talk about how much I hate my body, which is actually God's body, and this is a spiritual conversation I don't realize I'm having, then I'm creating a rift that the enemy can come into. Because we don't say it, we might not even think it overtly, but subtly what are we saying to God? I'm not pleased with you. I'm not pleased with what you've given me. I'm not pleased with this body. And we don't acknowledge that we live in a broken world and that sin has broken our bodies and that sin has broken everything, even my sin. We don't acknowledge that. All we do is we subtly come to God and say, you're not good enough. What you've given me is not good enough. And, 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 and to see that and to understand it, that that creates a rift that the enemy would love to get into. The enemy looks for any opportunity to come into our lives and to create separation between us and God. And he can come in on those discussions. You see, it's easy for the enemy to take repeated dislike and make it into self-loathing. Then we begin to question why anyone would love us if we are able to accomplish anything that matters and ultimately if we really matter. And you know, maybe you're sitting there and you're, you're like a really strong-willed person and you're like, well, that would never happen to me or whatever, I don't, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Happens to so many of us though. We begin to have these conversations and we express the subtle disappointment with God and the enemy comes in and he, and he creates this separation that we don't even recognize is there. And the next thing you know, there's something about myself that even every time I think about it, every time I look in the mirror, I, I, I loathe it. And, and, and that's a spiritual dynamic that's happening and creating separation between me and God and beginning to hamper what I'm able to accomplish. How many times have I known people who were were who, who amazing people and they refuse to walk into a situation, they refuse to do something because of an insecurity, because of something that they didn't think about themselves was, was perfect and right and all of those things. Is not, do you not see that just so plainly that it, can, that it can hamper your purpose that God has put you here on the earth for? When you allow something repeated and the enemy comes in and amplifies it and you begin to believe something about yourself that just is not true? Yes, that was a question. I know it was a long run on sentence, but it was a question. Do you not see how it can hamper? Yes. I mean, it's, it's certainly plain here on Sunday morning. It's a beautiful day outside. It's Sunday morning. We're talking about God, certainly plain. Well, the enemy finds us in the, in the darkness. He finds us in the, in the mirror in the morning and he begins to beat that drum and he begins to create that distance between us and the Lord. You know, it not only matters what I think and, and, and say about my body, but it also does matter how I treat my body. And I, I want to just, uh, I just want to give you this preface this morning. Look, uh, it's not the church's job to judge. Many of us grew up in judgmental churches. And when we grew up and, and uh, began to see how the people that were judging us actually lived their lives, it was a little disorienting. You know, I mean, I remember being 19, 20, 21, and I began to learn how these people at church that made me feel judged lived their lives. And for me, it was disorienting. And I was like, I'm not sure I believe in God. I mean, if these are God's people and they're so judgy and yet they're living these hypocritical lives, I'm not sure I believe in God. And I I mean, just kind of wrestled through all of that. Then the the reason for that is it's not the church's job to judge. Look, if God owns your body and you treat your body some which way, that's between you and God. 
It's not between me and you and God. It's not between the church and you and God. That's between you and God. You're gonna give an account for that, right? Not me. But with God's ownership of our body, we recognize that things that we do that are intentionally harmful to our body are, are like smoking or, or using drugs or anything that we might do or put into our bodies that harm our bodies. We recognize that this is a spiritual conversation where there is another invested party in it. And we say, well, I do this and it's just me. I'm just hurting me or whatever. And, and I'm hurting my body. And God says, no, I created you for a purpose. And the body that you have is the primary tool that I have given you to accomplish the purpose that you're going to accomplish on this earth. And so when you, when you begin to intentionally or, or not care about how you treat it, then there's another invested party in that conversation. This is why the scriptures talk so often about gluttony and, and gluttony is simply not eating in a healthy way. And, and we can't look around and say, oh, well, this person looks like that or looks like this and, and, and that. We know that appearance so often doesn't tell the story because there's so many other factors, Right? It's a question about between you and the Lord and, and, and what you're doing and what you're putting in your body and, and making those decisions of how I'm gonna eat and what I'm gonna drink and what I'm gonna do um, are spiritual decisions. And we recognize that so that when I decide my routines and I decide if I'm gonna exercise, if I decide what I'm gonna be characterized by, we recognize that that is a spiritual decision. First Corinthians chapter nine, verses 24 through 27 so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Now we need to remember that, you know, there's been a lot of talk in the news about anti-Semitism and there's just these, these things going on and, uh, around the country and, and uh, these different disputes and, and whatnot. But we need to remember that anti-Semitism did not rise uh, because people thought uh, that they, they resented the control that the Jewish people had, that they resented the money that they had. A lot of times we think it's because they were controlling and have money. Sometimes we think anti-Semitism came out of the church blaming the Jews for killing Jesus. But anti-Semitism is way older than the church and it originated because the people of God were always so healthy and they were always so strong. If you look back historically, the, the, the Jewish people would be in a land and surrounding that land, people would get plagues and people would get sick and the Jewish people were protected because God had commanded them how to eat, how to rest and about their sanitation, right? They said, don't go to the bathroom in the water that you drink. Sounds like common sense to us, but in the ancient world, right, this was a revelation. And so they, they look at the Jewish people and they're like, they're not getting sick and we're getting sick. They must be evil. They must be causing this. They, that, this must be, they must be the reason. Our gods hate us because they're here. No, no, no. <laughs> you're, you're getting sick because of these things. And so we recognize that the law command, you know, gave the people and the people followed it and they were healthier than the people that were around them and the people began to hate them. So Jesus comes and he says to us, listen, followers of Yahweh in the New Testament, you no longer have to follow the dietary restrictions or even the sanitary restrictions that were found in the Old Testament. You are free. Paul said that the law was like a schoolmaster. It led us to spiritual adulthood and maturity in Jesus Christ. So imagine, I mean, I know you're a little kid and you get mad at your parents because they won't let you eat candy before you go to bed, right? And you make a promise to yourself, when I'm older and I have my own house, I'm gonna eat all the candy before bed, right? <laughs> And you tried it, <laughs> you've tried it. How'd you sleep, right? How'd you feel when you, when you got up? And we recognize we have freedom in Christ, but that doesn't free us from the consequences. It doesn't free us from the consequences of it. And we're still responsible to say, okay, how am I gonna treat this body that God owns? Now, here we go. The Bible does not say that drinking alcohol is a sin, but the Bible does say that being drunk is a sin. The Bible does say that my influence over other people, if I influence them to do something that is destructive in their lives, that it's a sin. That if somebody sees me and they drinking and they decide they're gonna drink and then they destroy their lives and they destroy their family's lives, that I bear part of the responsibility for that because I was the example for them. The Bible does say that if something has more influence over me in my thinking or in my actions than God does, then that thing is an idol that God is supposed to be my one I run to when I'm stressed, that God is supposed to be the one too that I run to when I'm overwhelmed and fatigued. God is my hope. 
And when anything else provides for any of those needs, then that's an idol and that is a sin. Also, there was a study uh, that was done. It was commissioned by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, it began in 1990, 1991, and it concluded in 2016, and the, and the results were published. The, this study was conceived uh, with the idea that they wanted to determine how much alcohol was beneficial to our health. Something like if you drink a glass of wine, is that beneficial to your health? That's been uh, something that's been around for many years that people thought. And this study that was done in 195 countries over 26 years concluded that any amount of alcohol you d- drink does a degree of brain damage. They described alcohol use as a global burden uh, that, that was that, uh, on the earth. And, and so for these reasons and for many others, I, I believe because I've seen the destruction that alcohol creates in people's lives. Uh, I know I've seen hundreds at this point in my life in ministry. I've seen hundreds of families that have been negatively impacted. I've never in my however many years of ministry, it's too many now to say out loud, it's embarrassing, but um, I've never had somebody come to me and say, you know, we were struggling and uh, we were at odds with one another, but then we started drinking and it got better. You know, I mean, now, now we're pretty much drunk every night, and man, it's amazing. I'm, I'm so fulfilled. But I have had the opposite story so many times, dozens and dozens of times of, man, we were going well, we were doing well, and then they started drinking, and now uh, our, our lives are off the rails. And so for these reasons, I believe, and this is my take on it, and I'll give it to you. This is my take, red flag, this is Jason's opinion, oh, ultimately, who cares? Read the Bible for yourself. But my take is that Christians ought not to drink. And and what we ask of the leadership here at Faith is that they do not drink because by definition, leaders have influence. And if you're gonna use that influence and somebody else is gonna see you, I mean, imagine you see me drinking or you see a church of pastors council or you see a worship team and they're drinking and you see it and you're like, well, oh, it's okay. And then where does that lead you in your life? And so I'll leave that with you, all right? That, that you can take that and do with it as you would. It is not the job of the church to judge. It is not my job to judge. You will stand before God and give an account for you. But I just wanna give all the things out there so that you can't say, well, nobody told me, right? And we need to think about that. There is another invested party in the conversation when you think about what you're gonna do, what you're gonna eat, what you're gonna drink, how you're gonna live. God who gave you your body. And my body is the tool as we said, that I will use to accomplish the purpose for which God put me here on this earth. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, do you not know that in, in the race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Look, if I allow the enemy in to convince me that I hate my body, and that I don't fulfill the call of God on me, it's gonna detract from my purpose. If I abuse my body and don't treat it uh, as I should and I don't take care of it, then that's gonna shorten my purpose and my ability to fulfill the purpose that God has given me in this world. And, and this is, I think, plain from the scriptures. What Paul is saying is, listen, you gotta be disciplined. You gotta have self-discipline. And when I refuse to have self-discipline in my life, it not only opens me up to things like gluttony, but it opens me up to lust and covetousness and anger and gossip and other thinking patterns and habits in my life that are so destructive and so against the will of God. If you you walk out of here and you think, well, I don't know about any of that stuff, at least think about where is the self-discipline in my life? Am I doing any of those things that Paul talked about or am I just letting myself run amok? Do I let my thoughts go wherever I want them to go? Do I just let my behaviors go anywhere? Where is the self-discipline in my life? Genesis chapter three and verse six. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Is our spirituality so divorced from our daily habits that God doesn't have any influence so that when we walk by a temptation, there's no strength to resist it. Is our self-discipline and just our daily habits so divorced, it's like, well, I'm spiritual, 
I live in the 3%, I go to church, I pray, I read my Bible, but that doesn't really bleed into how I live my life. Like my habits and thinking about what I eat and what I drink and what I do to the point where when there's a temptation there, I have no real power to resist it. And we see Eve allowed even in that perfection of Eden to see a separation between how she operated and the glory of God in that moment. And the calling on us is that there would be no separation. God has purchased my body and he has filled me with his Holy Spirit and he has a purpose and a plan for my life and our lives. He's called us. You have a purpose. Everything you do matters 100%. And if everything I do matters, everything that I do 100% matters, then I have to think about the tool that God has given me to accomplish those things. And as we pray this morning, I, I wanna pray first and foremost for our thinking patterns. You know, maybe you're in a place where you've been beating yourself up for so long that it's just almost just so routine to you that you don't even recognize it. You get up in the morning and you just think about how much you hate yourself or this aspect of yourself. And I think the Spirit of God would come in and say, uh, you need to stop. You need to realize, I, I, I gave you this, I'm working through this. In fact, one day I'm gonna glorify that body and, and you're gonna love it. And God sees that. I also want us to pray about our habits. And uh, again, it's between you and the Lord, but to pray and say, God, is there something I need to change? I, I realize there's an invested party in this conversation that I haven't been listening to. And I wanna invite you in, God. Lord, as we come to you this morning, Lord, we ask for your grace. As we come to you this morning, we submit our thought life to you. And God, I just ask you, God, that you would speak life, that you would speak hope, that you would speak purpose. Lord, that you would allow us, first of all, to recognize the narrative that is running in our heads, that God would speak curses over our own body. And instead, God, that we could turn those things over to you and that we would begin to see how you could use those things, God, for your glory, for, to accomplish our purpose. Lord, I pray if there are habits or, or things that we need to change in our lives, God, that we would begin to listen to you and be directed and guided by you. Lord, to follow your ways, Lord, that will lead us, God, to the best possible life for us. Lord, I recognize our bodies are broken by sin and we're not gonna be perfect. But Lord, you can take us in our imperfection and redeem us and use us to accomplish great things, God. So we surrender to you and ask that you would use us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's stand together this morning. Our prayer team is coming at this time. If you have a need in your life that you would like to pray with someone, maybe you have an appointment coming up this week, maybe you have a loved one that doesn't know the Lord and, and they, need to, they need to find God and you wanna pray, there's power in agreement. Maybe there's a, a need that you're discouraged about in your life and you need someone to pray with you and speak life into you. These people would love to pray with you this morning. Even as we dismiss and everybody heads out the door, you could come this way if you have work to do with the Lord. God, I pray your blessing on your people today. God, give them peace that passes understanding, a hope that resides in them, Lord, that emanates out to others. So much so that the people around them take notice and they come and they say, what's the reason for the hope that is in you? And our answer will be, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. He's given me hope in this life. He's given me purpose in this life and hope and purpose in the life to come. And it grounds me so that the, the ups and downs of this life don't affect me. My life is built on the rock. God, I thank you for this hope, and I pray this peace on your people now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Peace be with you.